Melanie Curtis has jumped out of an airplane more than 11,000 times. What have you done today? <laughs> All kidding aside, it takes a lot of courage to do something difficult, but there's more to success and fulfillment than learning how to skydive without having a panic attack. This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 421, Courage, New Beginnings, and Flying High with Melanie Curtis. Good morning, I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My guest today has excelled at the highest levels in the sport of skydiving, has set world records with her team, and has worked around the world as a headlining professional skydiver. She is the current executive director of the Women's Skydiving Network nonprofit, and with that, co-founded the Highlight Pro Skydiving Team, which is an all-female demonstration jump team. She is also a life coach, author, podcaster, and easily one of the most positive people I have ever met. And now here is my interview with Melanie Curtis. Oh my God, Jeff, it is so great to be back. Yeah, it's been, I think it's been five years since you were on this oh podcast God. last, which seems like forever ago because a lot has happened in the world in the last five years. Um, I want to do just a brief recap for you, your life, your career, anything that's, any highlights that you think are, are notable in the last few years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can't even go out with a friend and have them ask me, what's going on in your world without having like a totally blank, not even knowing what to start with. That's how mm. much it feels like has happened. I mean, certainly with the pandemic, I always sort of say I have COVID time warp, where <laughs> it is like it could have happened three months ago, or it could have happened three years ago. I'm not sure. But yeah, the highlights, I would say, gosh, Obviously, I wrote and published my most significant work called How to Fly Life Lessons from a Professional Skydiver, and it just launched on Audible, so I'm super stoked about that, thrilled about that, really working on sharing that really widely with the world because I believe so strongly in the quality of that work, which is awesome to feel. And I, I highlight that because of the entrepreneurial path. When you're creating things and you're you're out there and you're kind of making stuff happen, you're not sure if it's good and da, da, and then over time having experience such that I can I feel really so clear and so content with this piece of work. So that's a huge one. Um, I published another couple of books, actually, uh, that preceded this book. So that's also happened. Nice. Uh, yeah, I my life coaching business is strong. I mean, I recently redid my website, that type of entrepreneurial stuff. I live in New Jersey. I don't know if I was living in New Jersey when we last spoke, hmm. but I love that as well. That's a part of my personal life that has been wonderful, sort of finding a place that feels like home and feels like myself, like me. So I'm right outside New York City, and I really, really love that as well. That's awesome. Yeah, that is near. That's fantastic to hear. Um, I really like the fact that you mentioned that you feel good about the book because mm -hmm. I feel like there is so much about, I don't know, the creative process and making things and putting it out into the world and then having, you know, total apprehension and fear and this that lack of sense of, you know, did I do something that was valuable? And so yeah. I'm glad that you feel good about it because I feel like that's that, that's a good feeling to have. Yeah, thank you. You know, and it takes time. And that's the thing. That's the nature of, of this, of How to Fly, is that it is an entire anthology of essentially 11 years of me writing a monthly column for a magazine, a skydiving magazine. So I didn't even really mention the skydiving work that I've doing been doing in the last five years. But the column itself, the experience of listening to me read the book for like if you get the audible version is is this you can feel and you can hear the evolution of me as a professional skydiver yes as a writer <laughs> because <laughs> the original columns are quite cringeworthy and uh you know as a as a person as a human being as someone who goes through actual hard times and has to figure out how to get through those and then what what is the insight extracted from experience you know i think about it and i go okay i write in these sh these sort of short term bits so i write a monthly column it's 600 to 800 words every month no big deal but over time putting that together you get you get to see a bigger picture so you could take one column and just 
get a lot of really good insight from one, one column. You know, they're really consumable separately. And then the whole experience of them put together is really interesting, I think, now that it actually is all collected. So can you explain that part for our audience in case they don't understand that the book itself is a collection of these columns, right? Yeah, it's the entire collection. So never, I never missed an issue in over 11 years writing for this magazine. And that is something I am wildly proud of. There is no way, by the way, Jeff, that I would have written that much without the accountability of being a part of this publication. Mm. I, I mean – I think certainly people can do that and they achieve that. And that's amazing. I don't know if I would have been able to early on without that accountability that was connected to someone else that wasn't necessarily me trying to struggle through my own uh, resistance to having to be perfect. And, oh, God, the torture of those early columns comparatively to the ones that I wrote later. It's, uh, oh, my God, as a the trajectory as a writer is really interesting as well. And how you sort of become willing to kill your darlings. (laughs) I don't know if you've heard that phrase, but you become less obsessed, I think, about what other people are going to think about it. Like at first, when I first started writing the column, it was sort of the start of my life coaching business. And I was very attached to that outcome where I'm like, oh, my God, I'm really successful as a skydiver. But, man, I really want to be good at this this life coaching thing, you know, and will people like me? Oh, I, you know, and it's really being nervous about that, but being brave to put myself out there in this new form. So that's sort of one of the ways that I did that back in the day and consistently over time. Yeah, I think the accountability piece is a huge one because I know for me when I launched this podcast eight and a half years ago, you know, I committed initially to doing the show once a week and eight and a half years later, it's still a weekly show. And I think that that is, I know for me that the only reason why the show even still exists at all is because I committed to doing it once a week in the beginning and didn't quit. And I feel like there's so much to be said about success in any area where if you have that sense of, you know, there's a deadline, I'm going to hit it and I'm going to, I might be awkward. It might sound bad. I might regret it later, but it'll be <laughs> live. It'll be published. And I feel like yeah. that act of just publishing or putting the work out there, there's so much value in doing that. And then of course, yeah, you can reflect back and, and know that your original work is kind of bad or whatever, but you can grow. And I love that process over time and, and having that structure built in. Yeah, and I'm a huge believer, and I've had this confirmed to me with feedback from people that either follow me on social media or uh, have worked with me or whatever, however they might know me or or follow me, that the showing the process and showing the growth is what's inspiring to people. It is not motivating and inspiring to people when they just see someone being successful and having no fear and having no worries or not being human or not having any emotions. It's That's not an achievable, relatable, resonant share. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's the share and that's great. And that's not, I'm not suggesting everyone needs to go out and be super vulnerable. It's, it's assessing the version and depth of vulnerability that we're willing to share. Now, this is another thing that is very clear in the evolution as you read through How to Fly as well. And I keep bringing that that up because it's such the it's a really perfect example of this. Of the depth of the writing was only as deep as I was as a person mm. early on. And you can slowly see as I go through some of the hardest times in my life when I, you know, I. Get a, go through a painful divorce, and I, I have to work through that. I go through sort of a loss of identity when I am two years out of the sport of skydiving, where I'm like, oh, my God, professional skydiver, like Melanie Curtis, professional skydiver. I know who that is. That that woman is is confident, is sure of herself, is very strong. And then this Melanie Curtis without skydiving, pff, who who is that? Like, I had no idea who that person even was. I started skydiving when I was 18 years old. And so to have that experience as well, to really have a life experience, a hearty experience of this different version of life allowed me to come back to skydiving in such a 
deeper and more rich way on top of then having a depth of life experience, a depth of healing, a depth of pain that I was able to then meet my clients in as well. You know, so you can, I, I don't think we all necessarily need to have giant breakdowns, but I think <laughs> nobody gets through life without them. You know what I mean? So yes. it was such a beautiful gift and it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, amazing to see and feel the depth in my own sharing and my willingness to do that as well. Well, there's a trust factor there too. I mean, if I can see that you have struggled, I can relate to that because I know what struggle is because everybody does because we're yep. all working through something. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think you're, to your point that, you know, you can't just be the, you know, look at me, I'm totally confident I have no fears person because <laughs> who is that? Like, that's not right. a real person. You know, that, that's impossible to relate to. And so, yeah, I love the fact that, you know, both of us have that same perspective. I think that we need to just, we're, we are ourselves, we are authentic to the best of our ability. I mean, yeah. I remember doing my podcast a few years ago where I released a few episodes Episodes that were unedited. So it was just yeah. a raw recording. I had never done that before. And it scared me to death because I was like, <sighs> I don't want anyone to hear the ums, the ahs, the coughing, the goofiness, <laughs> right. the change of direction in my thought, like all of that. I just put it out there and I haven't, I have not done it since because I was too scared to re- <laughs> yeah. repeat that process. But I feel like that's so important sometimes to be that willing to say like, this is who I am. Just this is it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and that's part of the process too. In my experience is yeah, not every time that we are brave and we overcome a fear and we put something out there, is it the is the lesson that oh i can do that and i'm going to keep doing that more and more sometimes the lesson is oh ooh, okay that that really wasn't for me and that's great that's just as valuable as something becoming you know opening up a pathway for us to to lean in it's just as useful for us to go to have clarity around what's not for us So one of the things I've discussed in this podcast before was the the one time that I went skydiving. Yes. Um, so I know you've done it, what, 11,000, I think, is the number? Yeah, 12,000? Yeah, yeah. Some ginormous yeah, number. Yeah, over that now, but that's okay. Well, there you go. I don't know, 15 million. <laughs> Let's go with that. So I have jumped once, and it was the scariest moment of my entire life. I've not repeated it. I want to again. But I, what I'm curious about from that angle is I want to hear your take on what it means to face a fear and how you get past that and then what your life looks like on the other side. Because I feel like your entire career is based on doing something that most people refuse to do. Like They wouldn't even attempt it. And so the idea that that's all you do in some respects feels like you are an an other human. Like you're just beyond this like level of what you usually experience. So talk to us about what that means to to master something we're all scared of. Thank you. I take that as a compliment because I feel like what it, what it points to is not necessarily, again, I'm, that I'm so superhuman. I, I talk a lot about how I had to figure out how to work through my fear and anxiety because I felt like I had a lot of it. Like I was a very, I'm a very sensitive person. And I mean that very positively. I, I think my sensitivity, my empath- empathy, my sensitivity to those around me and the situations I'm in is actually a, a strength. And learning how to manage that, how to become masterful with that feeling of fear has inadvertently become a big part of my life's work. And so, yes, you see it for sure in the literal act of skydiving. We don't know how to go skydiving. We don't know how the gear works. We don't know what an airplane, how an airplane works. We don't know what to do when the door opens. We don't know where to push our body when we actually leave into the relative wind. Like there's a million details that could go into actually jumping out of an airplane. We don't know how to fly a parachute. How do you land a parachute? You know, there's so many things. So we learn that if we incrementally take these pieces of this bigger puzzle, so I can absolutely, and this is so applicable to my entrepreneurial career as well. So like a huge chunk of of the book is the center of my obsession with entrepreneurship, where I'm like, oh my God, I'm this thing called an entrepreneur now. Like, Hmm. (laughs) like I'm taking that on and starting to listen to shows like yours, starting to 
read tons of books, starting to try this whole morning routine, starting to try doing this type of recording and this type of, oh, I'm going to do a YouTube channel or I'm going to do that. And, oh, I'm going to say this about my story. I'm going to tell you this about myself. And it's at every point, there's some level of vulnerability there. There's some level of I'm putting myself, quote unquote, out there, not necessarily for judgment, but maybe I'm afraid of failing. Maybe I'm afraid of not feeling good enough. Maybe I'm afraid of it not working uh, or whatever. There could be any number of things that are triggered more deeply inside of us when that anxiety and fear comes up. And so for me... I, I feel like because I went skydiving, it sounds so silly, but at such a young age, I learned early on that I had to at least question the fear that I was feeling. So if I think I can't jump out of a perfectly good airplane and live, and then I land and I'm not dead, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it sounds so ridiculous. I have to be like, whoa, I was wrong about that. I was wrong about myself in this way. What what should I what could I take on that is a manageable bite that moves me toward this bigger end and then be essentially relentless toward that end. Your podcast is a great example. 8 plus years of doing it week to week, relentless, like a metronome. Me writing my column for 11 years, it's a, it's a metronome. And then being able to reflect on that long-term and, and really see what the long-term builds into, that can inspire us in the present to start something that seems so far away. Well, and to a certain degree, I feel like what you're talking about here with kind of embracing this new identity as an entrepreneur, uh, to me, what I'm hearing is like you're OK with being new again, with starting yes. over again. And, yes. and when, when we're new at things, that's when things are most scary because we don't know. Mm-hmm. We don't know yet. And there's so much we need to learn. And we, we are aware that we don't know so much that that for me is where all the fear then kicks in. It's like a fear of the unknown is enough to force us to say stay still. Right. And not yeah. move. And I feel like when you're willing to push past that, then a whole new world is available to you. But you have to take that first step, which I think that's exactly what you've been doing, which is a wonderful example of that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, man. I think about (laughs) – this cracks me up. I think about the (laughs) – I'm sorry. It's so funny to me. The process of recording an audible book Mm. is so (laughs) – it's it's Wow. There's so much more that goes into it than you would think. And I definitely had parts of that journey where I got disheartened, where I'm like, oh, my God. Like one time, for example, so I'm using my normal mic that I use to record for the the podcast that I do with one of my professional skydiving colleagues. We have a podcast as well. It's called trust the journey dot today. But anyway, the mic that I use for that and the software that I use for that, we use audio hijack. And I was like, cool, I already know how to do this audio. And I got some coaching from an audio engineer that I hired and I, I had him coach me, which was good. So I knew I was sort of set up to, to do it well. And something, just something weird happened with the tech and like six hours worth of audio that I recorded was unusable. It was like, oh, it was so, (laughs) it was such a disheartening moment to the point where I then was newly scared where I'm like, I am now afraid to record more that it's going to be in the red or unusable audio. So that blocked me for a while. I had to basically figure out a different recording setup to get through that fear too. I know the feeling. I've done a lot of audio (laughs) over the years. And the only thing I could tell you is that you have to do like so many bad takes and so many mistakes and so many just mess ups, uh, whether it was technical or, or it was you or it was everything. Like there's so many things that can go wrong. Like I know that feeling of having to realize like what I just did is a total disaster. It has to be redone. <laughs> right. And it's it sucks. Like it's the worst feeling because there's there's so much energy put into it. So much of yeah. your life that you pour into it. And then to have to redo it. It's like I'm tapped out. Like I don't want yeah. it to be more. So, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. 
Well, and it's, it's, that's, and then the question is, of course, it's not, I mean, we can absolutely sit here and validate that. And hopefully people who are listening are like, okay, cool. Well, at least they maybe if I screw up, they've screwed up too. But I think the better, you know, even the follow on question, not necessarily better question, but the follow on question is how, how do we then get through that? And for me, I had to, like I said, I sort of sort, I sorted out a separate solution and learned more about audio and stuff like that, which was fine, hardware and software and stuff. But what I also did was I, I gave in, I really gave in to the process as in I, I committed, I knew I was committed as in I am going to do whatever it takes to complete this Audible book and complete it at a standard and a level of quality that I am proud of. So that was my goal. I'm like, I, I know I'm going to do that. And what I gave into is I gave in, I was like, it is going to take as long as it's going to take because mm. I don't know what's going to happen. This is totally new for me. So when I allowed myself the the space, that helped me just feel more peaceful in the process, which then helped me better perform the the material as well. You know, like you said, oh, you have to do X number of takes. I learned pretty quickly that I had to read every column in their entirety out loud once, once minimum without even recording it in order to get ready to potentially record it. Yeah, it's I mean, that process of learning what it takes I mean, just to warm up or just to get through the process well. But then to your point about this kind of mentality you take into it, I was thinking of that kind of how I relate to running because I've done a lot of marathons in the past. I know that one of the the biggest challenge with endurance running is the mental game, right? Mm -hmm. So you're in the middle of something that's challenging and all you can really think about is how many miles you have left which is a daunting number. If that's all you think about, you'll go crazy and you'll quit. Mm -hmm. And like that can't be what's in your brain all the time. It has to be more more present minded, but also with that sense of I'm just going to be here for a while and I'm okay with that. Uh. And I'm okay with the struggle, the pain, the difficulty, because that's what this is. That's why I signed (laughs) up for. Right. Right. The the obstacle is the way, as the title of the book uh, from Ryan Holiday says, like that is what this is and once you are okay with that that struggle that you that that's what you want to do every day then all of a sudden the task is no longer this ridiculous thing to pursue it's just what you do and then all of a sudden it's fine but that it takes a real mental shift to get to that point it is so true so true and so much is like that whether we're talking about becoming a skydiver earning an A license or becoming a an experienced skydiver and learning how to do a certain style of flying, whether it's being an entrepreneur or having a, a YouTube channel that is really quite successful or whether it's writing a book or finishing some kind of audio project or whether it's running an actual marathon, whether it's, I don't know, building a deep friendship with someone that you really respect and admire. It, it, it really goes, it, it helps everything. You know what I mean? It helps mm-hmm. everything when when we bring patience and acceptance to the process and openness and detachment to the to the process while bringing that sort of relentless follow through. Are there any columns that you wrote that when as you went through them, you thought like this really represents like a really good version of me or like something where you thought like this, like this highlights what I was trying to, to do here? Because I feel like there's oh. always those moments where you think like I did really good work here. Like I want to highlight that. Like, are there any columns for you that stood out like that? Yeah. Oh, God, there's a, there's a lot of them. <laughs> there's a lot of them. What I will say is one of my favorites that I ever wrote was Grandma and Gandhi. That was the column that I wrote sitting with my gram in her hospital room, the when she was dying, basically. Mm. And recognizing this wasn't wasn't even a this was one of my earlier columns, but it's it's still one of my most favorite because it speaks so clearly and so well to the things that matter the most. And the other thing I'll say is that the last two years of my writing are by far, bar none, the best writing I've ever done. Mm. And it's exciting to me as a writer, as a as a creative in this form, someone who really, like I believe deeply in courageous self-expression as avenue to our highest healing, to our highest 
contribution to others, to ourselves, and to the world. Like, I really, really believe that. That's what motivates me to torture myself as a writer, <laughs> 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 which any writer I think will get. Um, but yeah, so I'm thrilled at that. The, so the last, you have to make it through the beginning, you know what I mean? And that's mm. why the whole book is an experience. And even reading it, I had to basically go back into the character essentially of myself in 2010, in 2012, in 2015, knowing what was happening, but also knowing what I was, where I was consciousness level at that time. So like, for example, later on, I talk more about social issues. And that's something that I didn't mention at the beginning when you asked what happened in the last five years. I've co-founded and I co-lead an all-female demonstration jump team now that is phil philanthropically funded by a nonprofit and that allows us to partner with social impact organizations using skydiving as the vehicle to carry these sort of messages that matter. And so I've done a lot of bigger media, a lot of, you know, giant demonstration jumps that get us on ESPN and Good Morning America and all of these sort of big channels. But why that matters and why I bring that up is not to be like, oh, look at me. I've been on Good Morning America. It's that when the opportunity came to me to be on Good Morning America or whatever news I was on and stuff like that, when that microphone goes in my hand, I've, I've done the work to use that opportunity to say what matters the most. And so that is really exciting to me too. And why I would say I wouldn't necessarily pick an exact single column, but I would say if you and when you make it to the end of like the end of my book, the last two hours, it's it's really, really, really good stuff. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see that that process as you kind of unfold. Let's use the writing as a great example of this, where you have the chance to kind of spill your soul out on paper yeah. uh, and to see that play out over time. And I feel like there is definitely that sense of, of third partiness. We can look back at yourself and know, yeah, who you were at a certain time. Have, have you, did you see themes that ran through your work over that decade to say, like, you know, this is kind of who I was for a long time and or to see shifts in who you were over time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the themes are connection, you know, absolutely relationships, love, hilarity being core themes. The core practice that is modeled throughout all of my writing, at least in How to Fly anyway, is the what I mentioned earlier, this idea of reflecting and extracting insight from our experience. So if we look at the things that are happening in our lives and we ask ourselves the question, what is the positive value here? What what can I learn from this? How could this possibly be for me? You know, and really wonder and practice the the view the positive view, like that's one of my core beliefs That's that really, really supports me in my life is that the universe has my back. And so that that everything is happening is for me. So I, if something really sucky is happening or something that's really challenging me, or I'm having an issue with maybe a relationship, a struggle or conflict, or something with my work is not necessarily going the way I want it to go or whatever, whatever, any sort of challenge we might face. I ask myself those questions because I believe, I'm like, I know this is for me. I know there's positive value here. So what is it that I might be missing? Like, what is it that I could learn from this? And that practice helps me just make the most of my life and enjoy it so much more and not get caught into those downward spiral cycles of negative thoughts and catastrophic thoughts and sort of the classic human brain that takes us down the negative road. 
Yeah, there's a, a quote from Albert Einstein I've had in my office for years that I've talked about on the show a lot before because I think it speaks what you just said. And the quote is, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I reflect on that a lot because what I'm looking for in, in every challenge is, well, what? how can I benefit from this? Like, how can I grow through this? I think that Absolutely. looking for that, like, like consciously looking for the good, that changes everything. Like, because then you avoid those ruts, you avoid that negative spiral of thoughts that can just really take you down quickly and be able to pull yourself back out of that and say, no, there's something here. Like there's something positive and valuable here. And and that for me has been just incredibly just meaningful to be able to lean back on some, a thought process that allows you to think better, which I think has been very valuable. Yeah. Growth, you know, that that's a theme for sure. You know, exact all the things that you just said. If I had to sum, s- summarize it into that singular word, it's that commitment to growth. So whatever it is that's happening, and and it could be like I mentioned, the whole dark night of the soul. You know, most people, and I mean, it's not like we. Hopefully, we don't go through it too many times, but most people go through those that really, really tough experience in their lives and their work at some point where they are like everything sort of blows up Mm, yeah, and it's tough or they lose a job and they're like, what am I going to do? Or they, you know, get divorced or, or a loved one or critical person in their life dies. It's, there's so many different versions of how life can step in and irrevocably and instantly change things for us. And those are the times when this frame of mind can help us the most because we those are the times we are most emotionally triggered and in the most pain. So it's not to disallow grief because this is a whole different conversation about grief and how important it is to feel our feelings and to grieve and to allow our humanity in every moment and every stage. And that's not to say, oh, just you know, there's lots to that conversation. So I'm very I'm simplifying it very, very much, but I think that that focus, like I said, on growth through all of the ups and downs is what turns that stuff into the value it's meant to become. So in the work you're doing today, how do you, or I guess with your personal life, your, your professional life, how are you pursuing growth now? Because I feel like there, I've gone through a phase recently where I've realized that what I used to do does not does not apply like it used to. Like <laughs> yeah. what, you know, what got you here will get you there. And I feel oh, like yeah. for me, that has been a life story. Definitely. I mean, obviously I'm in the middle of a transition with a second daughter coming I and, you know, my business is shifting in a number of ways. I feel like I've been going through not a midlife crisis, but definitely a, a pivot point, right? A transition yep. point. So how do you how do you manage those big points of life where you are very aware that things are changing and you want to be able to to put yourself in a good place going forward? Because I know that we all experience these big moments in life, sometimes all at once. But what do you do in those moments? Yeah, that's such a good question. Well, how am I managing growth right now? Specifically, it's so funny. The patience, the, the long game. I don't know if you are a fan of Dory Clark, but she just post uh, published a book called The Long Game. Hmm. Super good. But I've always been a believer in that mindset as well, that the building of the of the short term into something bigger, like we mentioned earlier. So anyway, in my work life, that is definitely occurring. As in, I, I this is actually in the book. I joke about how I have a fire hose. It feels like I have a fire hose on like 10 or 11 <laughs> right on my face and I'm like trying to to <laughs> take it all in. And so that growth phase, this is going to sound so oh god so uncool. <laughs> 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 but this is the truth. One of the things that I do is I have to make sure my organizational system is on point. Mm, If my organizational system is off point, I cannot possibly scale. So that's one thing I'm doing. Another thing that I'm doing is I am recognizing an opportunity as it's occurring and recognizing the potentiality for it to be short term. So for example, the skydiving team that I've co-founded and is funded by the philanthropic source who knows how long that will last? Like, I hope it lasts forever. It's so such wonderful work. It's amazing. 
And I go, well, I don't I don't know how long that's going to last. So I'm going to work really hard on that. And I'm going to use income from that to build MelanieCurtis.com and and create other teams and systems that will support that growth for that version, that arm of my business. I'm, I'm outsourcing in all the ways that I can to lift things off of my shoulders so that I can optimally perform in the roles where it is only me that can do it. So those are a few things that I'm doing. And I'm also just allowing my humanity. If I need to sleep, I sleep mm. because I know that I can only do as much as I can do. And I think that only comes from maturity where I'm like, okay, I, this is it for today. Yeah, I think that that, that I, I alone of, of rest and being able to acknowledge when you need it is, is <laughs> yeah. huge. I mean, even just my wife earlier today, I mean, she's eight months pregnant and she was like, oh. well, I need to I need to keep working through my lunch break today. And I was like, no, you are not like, go lay down. <laughs> right. Like, I can right. see that. Like, you, know, you know, outside perspective, I can see that you need a break. And I feel like we need those those voices oftentimes to like, get us on point. I love the, the fact that you brought up your systems because I feel like I've been going through, you know, in this pivot that I've been making, systems have been huge for me in terms of yeah. re re-examining, you know, where am I now? How do I improve the system? How do I drop the ones that aren't working? Working, add in the ones that can be better for me long term. And those kinds of questions for me are causing more creative thought, more positivity for the future, which is what I guess my question for you now is like, what is motivating you to, to continue to push? Like, what are you working towards that's like pulling you forward? Because I feel like when we're in these moments of transition, we oftentimes get stuck because we're not sure of the direction we're going. So how do you like what's pulling you forward right now? Oh, so on point. I think that highlighting what you just said is important for people to hear again is that that can happen when you achieve something big and this is a perfect example with me finishing how to fly and having it really be done really be out in the world i'm doing this big launch but what what then because like that happens we joke in skydiving about this thing called the post boogie blues a boogie is like a big skydiving event where you kind of plan and wait for it all year and then you have this amazing time you have the best jumps of your lives you meet amazing friends and you see old ones you love each other you it's just like the best and then after it's over people have this sort of dopamine drop this crash this sort of oh like what this malaise of what am i doing next and I think entrepreneurs can easily fall into this when they've completed a big project. So yeah, for me, because of the elevated work that I've been doing with Highlight, which is the skydiving demonstration jump team, and the Women's Skydiving Network, which is the foundation, that work plus the books and all of that, my next focus, I... I felt some of the same stuff where I was like, what am I doing next? I don't know, da, da, da. And then I realized, you know what? I think it's really time for me to focus on my speaking. I've never really focused on that. It just sort of came to me. I would get hired for speaking gigs here and there just because of my story and its uniqueness. And I've never really made it my priority. So I'm sort of excited to do that again. And and I say again because, you know, I've done Facebook Lives and tortured myself to get <laughs> more comfortable and stuff like that throughout the years. But yeah, that's what's sort of driving me. I have a big job in January. I'm very excited. My first in-person gig since COVID. So yeah, that's what's driving me forward right now, but also contemplating my next creative project and what that will be, because I personally always need something that's in that lane as well. Yeah, I know that feels. I just did my first in-person speaking gig two months ago. Nice. And it was what I was really excited about wasn't necessarily speaking. It was just human connection. It was I just know. seeing people and, and you know, face yeah. to face and being able to, you know, to teach live, to talk live. Like those are great things. But yeah. I mean, just that face to face time, I, I have found that yeah, I didn't realize how much I was missing it until I got some of that again. And it's it's a wonderful thing. Love um it. So, Melanie, in terms of your book, and people really want to dig into it, well, I guess my final question for for the book is, like, what do you think that skydiving has meant for you in the grandest sense? Like, what, uh, and if you had to extract one component of this, you know, lifestyle, this career, like, what has it really done for you as, as a real, like, sticking point? Oh, my God. It's really, really, and this, it sounds so cliche, but it's so, so rich and real when you connect to it, is that being brave is access to being free. 
you know? So mm. if like, what am I actually after? If I'm actually after, you know, freedom and connection and love and the things that come when we are free, when we are free from fear, that's what skydiving has really helped me access. And it's not just from jumping, it's from how it's motivated me and helped it and supported me in all the other ways I've been brave in my life as well. I love that. I think that bravery is definitely a component we all need more of. I'm glad yeah. that that's, yeah, that's been so strong for you. So Melanie, where can our listeners get a copy of your book? Where can they learn more from you? You mentioned your website earlier, but go ahead and repeat yeah, all the places they can go to, to connect. Yeah, cool. So all the versions of How to Fly, the Audible, all the links will be at melaniecurtis.com slash how to fly book. So that has all the different versions. If you're not into Audible, you can get the print copy there too. Uh, yeah, and it's on Amazon, of course. Uh, but anyone can email me directly if they want, mel at melaniecurtis.com. I still welcome that. It's funny, I listened to our old episode, <laughs> like I said earlier today, just because I'm like, oh, what did we say back then? And uh I said my email then as well, and I, I really still feel that way. If anyone wants to reach out, please, I welcome it. And uh, all the socials, but yeah, you'll find all that on my website. Excellent. Love to hear that. And yeah, I'm glad the one-on-one -on -one connection through email is also a good one too. And, and mine's still available as well. So if you want to email me, go ahead and do it. Yes. Uh, but yeah, that's awesome stuff. So Melanie, thanks again. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Jeff. And now for the action step this week, step into courage. Yes, you can choose to face the fear of skydiving, but I would challenge you to do something even more difficult. Start work on the one thing you know you need to work on. Now, facing fears is personal. Being courageous looks different for everyone, so define your fear and face it. Clarify what's going on and make a game plan to work on it today. This is where the magic happens. JeffSanders.com slash 421 is the place to go to get the episode notes. Also, subscribe to this podcast. Go to JeffSanders.com slash subscribe to get a full list of apps where this show is available. One more time, that's JeffSanders.com slash subscribe. And that's all I've got for you here on the 5 a.m. Miracle Podcast this week. Until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early. <laughs>